So what we address in this project is a challenging scheduling problem that has to do with electronic systems in aircraft. Uh, so it's a multiprocessor scheduling problem with precedence relations between the tasks with upper and lower bounds on the time lags uh, and the communication network to be scheduled. Uh, and it's a feasibility problem. So we want to find a, a schedule if it exists or prove that uh, no schedule exists. Uh, and this is a problem that's of importance for the development of future aircraft. So the problem is a pre-runtime scheduling problem where you, during the compilation of the system, uh, make sure that the software functions are given the hardware resources that they need to run their applications and pass the data. And scheduling is an essential part of the design process. Uh, and every time you make changes to your system, you need to make a new schedule. And typically when you design a new aircraft, uh, the design process takes several years and you keep making changes during the lifetime of, of the, the aircraft. Uh, and typically that's several decades. And if the scheduling fails, um, that means you need to make design changes and they, those are typically costly. So it's not okay to have some heuristic and just say, oops, my, my heuristic failed. Uh, you need to be rather confident that when you fail with the scheduling, it's because there exists no schedule. Uh, and as you will see later on, this is a rather large scale problem and it seems out of reach for the generic discrete optimization solvers. So what we do then, uh, we have designed uh, uh, the composition approaches that exploit the problem structure and also the power of the generic solvers. And we also had to enhance their efficiency by including some inexact components. And as always, when you work with a large scale problem, it's important to be careful with the pre-processing and how you handle and explore the data. Today's talk will focus on, on, on giving an overview of these decomposition approaches to compare their properties. So I will skip a lot of messy details. So if you, at some points, I think you will, will uh, think that, okay, there, there are some things uh, hidden below the surface here, and then you're completely, and then you're probably right, because there are a lot of messy details that I won't mention today. I will focus on, on, the, gen on the most important structures of this problem. So uh, the team and the setup looks like this. So the work is, as Steve mentioned, uh, is the result from a collaboration between Linköping University and Saber Aeronautics, where I've been part-time employed for six years now, uh, and to lead an R&D project. Uh, and as you can see, most of the members are affiliated with the company, but one of them, Emil Karlsson, is also a PhD student at Linköping University under my supervision. And, and with respect to this, I also have some, some news that few people know at the moment. And I will return full time to my academic position next month and only take part of this from, from the academic side from now on. So the outline of the talk looks like this. After the uh, introduction, I will continue with the technical background of this project. And I hope that people that have an interest in uh, electrical engineering will find this part interesting. Uh, and I will also, and I also want to mention that if you you're not that interested in electrical engineering, I will give the the problem formulation again from scratch without uh, considering the technical background uh, when we get to the problem formulation. So I, I will let you know when the technical gibberish is over and we focus on the optimization part. So if we try to put this work into some perspective, uh, the human attempts to, to fly traces far back in history. And it was not until the early 1900s that the attempts with powered flights were successful and the Wright brothers became famous for their first flights. And Saab Aeronautics was an early contributor to constructing aircraft. And during what can be called the mechanical era between mid 1930s and mid 1960s, new models were produced every third year. So every time you wanted to change something in your aircraft, you produced a new aircraft, essentially. Uh, and during this uh, time, the, the aircrafts were mainly um, mechanical machines. Uh, but with digital systems and more software functionality, the design principles and requirements have changed over time. So now you can make changes by changing your software functionality uh, and not the whole aircraft. 
And the new designs creates a new need for coordinating the resources uh, in the systems. And this is where, where optimization becomes useful. So what I refer to when I talk about avionics is the electronics in an aircraft. So the sensors that gather information, units that pro uh, where the information is processed, uh, actuators that control the aircraft, and various types of equipment that presents information to the pilot, like screens and other things. And what we will do in this project is prescribe down to the nanosecond what the electronic does. And there's a whole field dedicated to the question of, of, of making the avionics systems uh, so, so making sure that you can trust an avionic system. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give this technical background without relying on real-time systems terminology. And instead I will speak more in terms of, of engineering common sense. Uh, because there is a whole uh, complex area uh, dedicated to this. Uh, so examples of aspects you need to consider when you design an avionics system is that you need to create subsystems that you can validate independently, and you need to make sure that you prevent faults from propagating between different functions. And all possible scenarios needs to be covered and evaluated. So for example, if you uh, have some if statements um, handling different things, you don't only need to, to make sure that that you cover all the cases in your if statements, you must for each of them also understand what happens if the computer crashes during this uh, part of the code. So they need to understand everything that can happen. Uh, and also you need to make sure that the data sent between um, different applications is correct and protected from unauthorized access. So when you design a system like this, you have extensive uh, documentation and testing and certification processes. So if we look at the, the early aircraft, um, they, then they used federated systems, which means each function has a separate hardware. So if you want to, to have some functionality in your aircraft, you build an electronic box that handles this. And if, if that function is to communicate with something else, uh, you, you um, uh, put a cable between that and, and the other electronic box. So it's a hardwired system. And that makes it very easy to, to verify that everything works in isolation. And it's also easy to integrate because you just uh, put a cable there. But what happens is that you have limited synergy and you cannot really um, fully integrate the system. So this is how they used to do it until some decades ago um, when the scenery changed a bit. Uh, because nowadays when we have digital systems and, and computers, we also have new possibilities. And I found this graph online here. Uh, and on the x-axis you have time, and on the y-axis you have the number of thousands of lines of codes used in a specific aircraft over time. And I chose this picture. Uh, it shows uh, US military aircraft. And I chose this one because it had good resolution when I found it. But other curves for um, other um, also commercial um, aircraft looks looks the same. So you can see here that the system complexity has increased a lot over time. And together with this, you have the new needs of, of being able to upgrade and adapt and, and uh, reconfigure the system. And if we again think about the federated system I mentioned, uh, you can compare this to having all of these gadgets. Let's say you have a camera and a calculator and a phone, a GPS, a watch and a Game Boy. Uh, and, and these are examples of independent subsystems that most of us used to have. And let's say you were going running, uh, then you could use your watch to take the time and the GPS to show the route. And if you wanted to tell your friends about your accomplishments, then, then you picked up the phone and called them. Uh, but nowadays, most of us don't have all of these, but instead we have a smartphone with different apps on it. And, and this is an example of an integrated system uh, where you can 
you still have your GPS and your watch uh, and maybe you have a, a running app that tells your friends about your accomplishments instead. So here you have a much smoother integration. You don't need to, to do all of these things yourself. So your, your phone can do it for you. Uh, but the challenge is um, that if something happens with one of the apps, it can interact with the others. And that's not a huge problem when it's your phone, if something stalls and happens and you need to restart it. But, but if you're a pilot flying your plane and let's say you're about to land the plane and you uh, want it to, to pull down the landing gear and then nothing happens because the computer is busy calculating the fuel consumption or, or something else. So um, that's the tricky part with an aircraft that you need to be able to rely on it at all times. When you look at the more modern designs that they use in aircrafts, they talk about integrated modular avionics, and then you have a then you have sh uh, shared hardware, and then you use software to define the functionality, and you can use uh, you define this across the, the hardware that you have. And then it's much easier to have synergies and integration between different functions. But what becomes much more complex is the, the being able to, to verify everything in isolation and also how you integrate it without causing any problems. Um, so what they typically try to do is that, they, that you have three independent layers. You have the hardware layer and the software layer. And then you have, I just call it the glue here in between, in lack of, of uh, technical terms, that contains things like the operating system and the middleware, uh, built-in tests and so on. And the responsibility of this glue uh, is to make sure that you can make independence up, uh, updates of the software and the hardware. And, and also allocate the resources that the, the different processes need so that you can make sure that the system is, is trusted. More specifically, is that we've been looking at looks something like this, where you have an application layer and a communication layer. So this is the hardware view now. And when someone, when a, an application developer wants to, to create a new function, they only look at as this part of, of the resources. So they see that they have sensors and displays and actuators and processing units. And then we have a hidden layer here that handles the communication between these different parts. Uh, so it's only there to provide secure communication between uh, things in the application layer. So let's say you want to do some sensor reading uh, and then you want to process that and, and, and show something on a display. That means you have the data from the sensor, you send it to a communication module here, use a communication network, back to a communication module and go to the processing unit. And then it sends the data back to a communication module, to the communication network, and back to a communication module, and then to the display. So in the application layer, you can't uh, communicate um, di directly between things. You have to use this communication layer all the time. And the system is completely synchronous. Uh, and that means that you explicitly schedule everything that's going to happen in the system. Uh, so everything happens at, at, at a certain point in time. And of course, when you run the aircraft, you don't know what the data from the sensor reading will be or the actual contents of the computations here, but you allocate the resources that you need to make this happen. Uh, some more details about the communication protocol. So the communication network here is, is an ordinary ethernet, but the, the, the protocol is, is designed so that messages are sent in discrete time slots. Uh, and there are some different reasons for doing the, this, but one thing is that you have uh, access to the full bandwidth at that instance. In that discrete time slot, you can use all the communication resources available. So you can send data really fast, and that is an advantage. And the schedule will decide exactly when to send and, and, and get the data. And it's possible and it also supports multicast, so you can send to um, multiple receivers. And 
an essential part here, if you want to use the communication network, you have to perform some activities on the communication modules here. And as you will see later on, there are several activities that need to happen on this side and on this side every time you want to communicate. So that's kind of the cost for, for, for this um, kind of architecture. So just to summarize a bit, uh, when you design the aircraft, you must be able to, to trust it at all times. And in this integrated setting, you can create independence between different applications by having this pre-run time schedule with uh, start times for all activities and that you use the worst case execution time for all the activities. So you make sure that you have the resources to do what you need. So, and together this gives you a, a temporal partitioning of your system. And you also need a spatial partitioning, meaning that you need to decide where things should happen. And in our case, this is not part of, of the scheduling because it's decided by the engineers. So, and, and with this design where you separate the application layer and, and the communication layer, you can develop, verify and simulate the, the applications in isolation. And that's very important during the development project because then you can work on things in parallel. Uh, so you get a, a system that's adaptable by design. It's easy to upgrade and reconfigure. But of course, there is a price to pay for this. And the price, I would say, is in this glue between the software and hardware layer. And the scheduling becomes really complex. You need to schedule all the activities at once. And as you will see later on, this communication scheduling is rather intricate and, and detailed. It contains a lot of things to consider. So, and this is where I, I will stop talking about the electrical engineering part of the project. Uh, so I will introduce the, this problem again from, from uh, an optimization point of view only. So if you look at the system here, uh, here we have the communication network, the ethernet that I talked about previously, and it's connecting nodes. The red boxes here are nodes, and in each node you have a communication module which is responsible for the communication, uh, and then you have application modules. You can have one or you can have more than one. And if the application modules want to communicate, they use this communication module, and it's also used for communication with external systems and using the communication network between the nodes. So what we want to do is to create a schedule and it's a cyclic schedule that is about one second long. So the schedule we create, it's repeated every second when the aircraft is running. And that seems like a short schedule until you realize that the time resolution here is in nanoseconds, then you understand it's, it's a long schedule. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's about finding a feasible solution or prove that none exists. Uh, if we try to categorize this a bit, it's a multiprocessor scheduling problem where you want to schedule periodic tasks. And on the reason why I make a distinction between the application modules and the communication modules is that they have di very different characteristics from a scheduling perspective. If we look at the application modules, we have few tasks, they are very long, and we have several instances of them per major frame per second that we schedule. If we look at the communication modules, we have a huge number of tasks, uh, but only one instance per major frame. So essentially, oh, yeah, and also we have what we call dependencies, which are precedence relations with time lags. So they can be both between uh, tasks on the same module or tasks on, on different modules. And essentially what we want to do with, with the tasks is to create a sequence so that they don't overlap and we want them to have a start time. So that's the that part of the problem. But we also need to schedule the communication network and scheduling of the communication network means assigning these messages to the discrete time slots. So it's just an assignment problem. You need to decide in which time slot to send each message. But then each message is connected to tasks that actually performs this uh, activity of sending the message and, and that uh, that is the part that complicates things but if we look at this in isolation the only thing you need to do is, is choose a time slot for each message but since the choice of time slot uh, puts additional restrictions on the involved tasks we need to look a bit more carefully on, on, on what that means 
So I have an example here. I have a, a message that I want to send in this time slot, and that will put um, that will have an impact on the release times and deadlines of the other tasks. So if I send a message here, it means I need to use a send task here uh, to perform this activity from the communication module. And it also means that I need to prepare the message and uh, take it from the queue here on the receiving end and then uh, read the message. So there are these four activities involved in sending the message. And if we look at, at the, an example with two messages, where I put one here and the other one here, I need to keep the same relative order between uh, when, when I take them from the queue. So if I send that one here and that one here, then I must take this one from the queue first and then this one. The other activities don't have this kind of, of um, uh, ordering. Uh, so then you, th those you can do independently, but taking them from the queue is important to do in the right order. The trickiest part, I would say, is if you put two messages in the same slot. Sometimes you need to do that. Um, that means you, that, you um, that you will merge some of the tasks involved in sending the message. So these send tasks will be completely merged. They will become, two tasks will become one. And for the other ones, the prepare, queue and read, you will save about half of the time of, of one of the tasks. And that gives you some savings, so it can be beneficial to, to make these decisions of, of co-allocating the messages. So, uh, before we start to look at how to solve the problem, I want to give you uh, an example of, of an instance. This is the instance that we were given as, as a goal by the company. They said, okay, we want you to try to solve this instance. And I will display the instances like this um, in a graphic way. So I will illustrate the communication network here and the nodes connected to it like this. And if we first look at the number of messages, the instance has almost 4,000 messages to send. And in the red boxes, I show the number of, of uh, tasks on the application modules. So like you will see here in the top left corner, you only have 14 tasks on this application module to be repeated 64 times. So it's very few tasks. And then you can see on some of the, in some of the nodes you have two application modules, but it's typically one or two and very few tasks. So this is not an issue. Uh, if you look at the communication modules, uh, in the white boxes, the number of tasks are displayed. And you can see here in the top left corner that this one has over 16,000 tasks to be scheduled. So I think here you get, start to get an idea of where, where the challenge is. Um, so, and of course, we couldn't start with, with the largest instance. So we, we, tr we got also got some toy example from the, from the company uh, where we, we first played around with the MIP model. Uh, and. Uh, we tried to solve it uh, to find a feasible solution, but we, we weren't successful even if we ran it for a week. And we tried to mm, uh, model it in different ways. And we also try, tried some country programming approaches for small scale problems like this, but there, we had no success with this. So, so this is where we started the project. And uh, to understand uh, the, the composition approaches that I will present, we need to know a bit more about the, the problem structure. So to summarize the problem analysis that we did, I would say that there are two main computational challenges. Uh, one is this interaction between the task and the communication scheduling, because it's a messy part of, of, the, prob of the model. So if you look at the things you need to put up to, to solve the communication problem, it's rather messy. And the decisions you make here have an impact on the task sequencing. The other challenge is the huge number of, of tasks on the communication modules. You, we, we needed to be prepared for up to 16,000 tasks on a single module. And also we know that we have a long scheduling horizon. So it's 10 to the power of nine time points. We could rescale it a bit, but, but not much. Um, because we need to work with nanoseconds here. So when we consider the sequencing aspect of this 
I, I don't think time index formulations would work and but we wanted to have a look at order based formulations and see if they could stand a chance uh, and also perhaps considering programming would be better equipped for for this type of sequencing so so these are kind of summarizes the challenges that we had but there are also some good news we, we found some problem structure that we could exploit and the most important part of, of, of um, the problem structure looks like this. So now we, now we focus a bit on, on, the, uh, on sequencing of tasks. So in the original data, we have an example here with three tasks. And in the original data, each task has a release time and a deadline. So we know it needs to execute somewhere in this interval. But if we look a bit more carefully, there are lots of technical restrictions that kind of gives discrete time, discrete times to some tasks. We have some fixed tasks in the system. And if we use, combine this information and do some pre-processing where we propagate the precedence relations and, and the time lags uh, between the tasks uh, to, to remove parts of the timeline where we cannot schedule the task, it looks something like this. So we know that in a feasible schedule, Task one can only be here or here. It, it wasn't possible for that task to be here, for example. So that breaks down the, 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 this interval into sub-intervals. That turns out to be rather useful for us. Uh, and just to give you an idea of, of, of the impact of this, if I take this very large instance that we looked at, that I introduced earlier, uh, and count the number of task I before J decisions that we need uh, if we make an order-based formulation and only create the variables when they are really needed. Uh, by introducing the sub-intervals like this, we can reduce um, the number of such decisions by a factor of 10, if we consider th these intervals. And if we take it one step further and, and choose a fixed sub-interval for each task, then we can reduce it by another factor of 10. And this is just an observation that I want you to keep in mind when we look at, at how we de design the, the composition approach here. So, uh, to give an overview of the model structure, uh, and if we now include the knowledge about the task sub-intervals, you can view the model something like this, that we have a hierarchy of decisions. We need to schedule the application modules uh, and we need to assign messages. Sorry, I should press there. And um, this sequencing is uh, an easy part of the problem. Rather few tasks, but it has a large impact on the remaining solution space. The other part is assigning messages to slots. And this is a messy part of the model. Uh, and if we have a fixed communication schedule, that has a large impact on the remaining problem structure because then we are only left with, with sequencing of tasks um, if we fix this part. And then if we use, this, use these sub-intervals, we can consider that a decision as well to choose the sub-interval. And it turns out that if we combine, if we add some strengthening constraints, we can make really good decisions with respect uh, to the sequencing if we choose these intervals carefully. I will get back to this in, in, in just a short while. And then the final part is just sequencing of a lot of tasks. So it's computational challenging, but it's a well-known structure that we are left with here. So, uh, for the first approach that we designed, our mindset was that we wanted to create a really strong relaxation that we can use to discover infeasibility and if the problem seems feasible, we can find a schedule. So if we go back to our hierarchy of, of decisions here, we chose to create a relaxed problem that served as our master problem here where we included all of these three types of decisions. So we sequenced on the application modules, we assigned messages to slots, and we chose task uh, sub-intervals for our, our tasks. And then we, uh, as I mentioned before, 
if we're going to make this decision without doing the, the sequencing, it's crucial to include some constraints that strengthens the formulation. And what we do there is that we, we look at, we carefully choose some subintervals, um, uh, sorry, some, some, um, uh, in some segments of, of, of time on, on the timeline. And then we look at all the, the subintervals that are there and we make sure that we uh, don't um, assign too many tasks so that the workload gets higher than what would ever be possible to, to, to have in each of these segments. So, so we make sure to not uh, put too many things in the same place, essentially. And then for the sub problem, uh, we, we left the sequencing. And I, I put also that we use, uh, that we handle the AM um, sequencing here also, because even if we have a fixed order of the tasks, when we get to the, the, the sub problem here, we're flexible with respect to their start time. So this means that we end up with a problem that looks something like this. We have a master problem where focus is on placing the sub, placing tasks in sub intervals and assigning messages to slots. And I would say that this is a messy and rather challenging MIP model that we solve by Groby. Uh, and for our sub problem, uh, what's left is to sequence tasks with precedence relations with lower and upper bound on time lags. And uh, what we do here is that because we don't know when we get to this point, we don't know if if this sub interval assignment is, is feasible or not. So uh, we try to sequence as many tasks as possible. But if there are some tasks that will still overlap uh, because of this sub interval assignment, um, we just penalize that. And the objective is to to uh, minimize the the number of tasks that overlaps. So or to be more specific, we try to find subsets of tasks that causes conflicts with respect to sequencing. So here we use an order-based MIP formulation in Groby. And what we use for feedback to our master problem is these subsets of tasks that we identify to, to cause problem. And then we send them back to the master problem. And the master problem will sequence, the, sequence these, this subset of tasks for the next round. And then we end up with something that looks like this. So we have pre-processing. Uh, we have our relaxed problem or master problem where we do, uh, we refer to it in the paper as, as partial sequencing. Uh, and if we fail to solve this relaxed problem, that means we have proved that there is no feasible solution to the problem. Uh, and if we find a solution, we can restrict the solution space down to the sub intervals. And then we have a sub problem that we solve where we complete the sequencing while respecting all other constraints. And if we are successful here, we have our schedule. Uh, and if we fail, we know that then we have found a subset of tasks um, that we add to the relaxed problem and say, okay, for next time, you need to make sure that we can sequence these tasks. And if we run this, uh, for, an, uh, for, a, for a very long time, we will end up adding all the sequencing constraints, um, but we hope that we, we can avoid that. In practice, we only do very few iterations because the relaxed problem here is really strong. And I will also want to point out why this procedure works. I, I think the essential part here is that when we start, when we have the pure problem, we know that we have some hundreds of millions uh, of decisions, um, task I before J. And after pre-processing, we can reduce that to some tens of millions of decisions. And then we can reduce it down to some millions before we get to the sub problem. So that's the magnitude here of the number of decisions. Some results for this approach. Uh, we go back to the toy example that we couldn't solve within a week. It solves within less than a minute when we use this approach. If it, we look at a somewhat larger instance, we can solve this one with, within two minutes. And then we take a somewhat, uh, yeah, a rather challenging problem, I would say. Here we can see that in the top left um, communication module, we see that we are above 10,000 tasks here. And this is where we see that the, 
this method starts to struggle a bit. This was an instance we could solve, but it took almost 12 hours to solve the, the relaxed problem. So this method on its own didn't take, take us all the way. Um, if we look at, at this one, where we have 14,000 here, uh, we could not solve the relaxed model within 24 hours. And then we said that, okay, this, this, is, uh, this is not going to work. So the conclusion here was that if we have a communication module with more than 10,000 tasks, the relaxed problem becomes challenging. So to summarize the conclusions and the insights from, from this first decomposition approach, we managed to, to formulate a really strong relaxation of the problem. And in that sense it, serves, sense, it serves its purpose. But it turned out to be a bit too expensive. And the industrial partners said, OK, these results look OK, but we want you to solve the really large instances. And since we really like the, the formulation of this relaxed problem, it, because it, it handles most of the aspects of the problem, uh, we put our focus on, on efficiently finding solutions to, to the Rex problem. And then we turn to designing a math heuristic where we integrate our exact approach with the heuristic method. So here we had to do this trade-off between solving larger instances while losing some of the guarantees that we, that we had. And I will just briefly mention what we did. We, implemented an adaptive large neighborhood search where the neighborhood was to, in this relaxed problem, search over assignment of tasks to subintervals and messages to slots. And we treated most of the constraints as soft and then we penalized um, violating them. And the destroy operation was to free some tasks or messages uh, and then solve a reduced problems over the ones that we that we freed. And since this uh, is a rather messy model, we thought, okay, it's a good idea to use a myth solver and especially use the, the efficient heuristics uh, that it has. So we didn't implement anything on our own here. We used the myth solver again. And there are lots of, of the design considerations here. Uh, to make this work, we need to explore problem structure and knowledge even more. Uh, but I won't go into the details about this. But when we did this integration and uh, applied it to this large instance that I started to sh by showing you, uh, we actually managed to solve it. It took three days, but that's okay for such a large instance, I think. Uh, and if anyone's interested in the details uh, of what we did, we have some papers published on, on, on this. So, and we, we also have a second decomposition approach for this problem and this is ongoing work together with my student. And we said that, okay, in the first approach we focused a lot on, on um, find, in discovery if, if the problem is infeasible. But if we have less focus on that and instead try to find, try to find a schedule faster. So that's the mindset we have for, for the second approach. And if we look at, at the hierarchy of decisions again, it looks like this. And for the second decomposition approach, we just put the first two of the decisions here in the master problem. And then we solve the sub problem. We, we put more in the sub problem here. So the master problem in this case is about assigning messages to slots. It's a messy, but not very challenging myth model that we solved by Groby. And here it's important to start from a good solution. And we create a solution by solving a relaxation of the original problem to put messages in reasonable places. And, and the model we, in this relaxation has the same structure as the sub problem. So, so we solve it, we start essentially by solving a sub problem to, to get an idea on, on where to put the initial mes messages. Uh, and then the sub problem is about sequencing of tasks again with precedence relations with upper and lower bounds on the time lags. But in this case, we only care if the uh, sub problem is feasible or not. So we have a, a constraint programming model that we saw by IBM ILOG CP optimizer. And here instead, the feedback is finding 
infeasible methods to slot assignments. So here we have a logic-based vendors decomposition approach. And the scheme, uh, the layout is the same as before. We have our pre-processing, we have a relaxed problem, but here we only focus on assigning messages to slots. And if we fail uh, solving this one, we know that no feasible solution exists. I don't think it's very likely that we will end up here because this relaxation is not as strong as the other one, but who knows. Uh, the focus is that is going to this box where we restrict the solution space and solve a sub problem where we focus on, on sequencing of tasks. If we're successful here, we have a schedule and otherwise we add a vendor cut that prevents a specific assignment of tasks. Uh, tasks to messages here, uh, it's a typo, um, um, slots to messengers. When you look at this, and when I talk about the, the assignment of messages to slots, um, I guess most of you think that, okay, but this assignment, a complete assignment, it must be a very weak cut. And if you think that, you're completely right. Uh, so if we, if we would only, create a complete assignment of messages to slots and then um, create a cut based on that, we won't get much progress. The key here is that it's possible to evaluate partial assignments of messages to slots. So if we, if we look at the complete assignment and then we choose some of the messages and says, okay, I want to evaluate if this partial assignment uh, is feasible or not, then we can relax the problem in a good way. Uh, so uh, if we solve the problem and it's infeasible, then we know that this partial assignment is infeasible. So what we want to do is that we want to search for an irreducible, infeasible partial assignment. And the choice of words here maybe lead your mind in the right direction because this becomes very similar to finding an irreducible infeasible subsystem. So what we actually do here is that we use a depth first a binary search technique um, that was suggested for finding irreducible infeasible subsystems uh, from this paper by Atli Hanna and Schrage. Uh, that was published in Computers and Operations Research. Uh, so we use their search technique and what we do in each of the evaluations here is that we solve a constraint program. And by doing that, we can find irreducible, infeasible partial assignments. And those cuts are much, much stronger. So they are really useful. Uh, we do have some practical challenges with this approach also. Uh, when we solve the subproblem, there are three possible outcomes. It can find a feasible schedule rather quickly or uh, confirm infeasibility. But we also have some cases where we hit the the timeout limit and even if we try to add some extra time this doesn't make a difference so in some way we need to handle when we get the timeout cases where it's difficult to to the solve for the solver to determine if it's feasible or not and uh, what, what we've done this far is if no proper cut is found due to issues with timeout we add a timeout cut and this of course might remove a feasible partial assignment but it's a way to prevent the search from getting stuck. So for, we add the cut and hope that it won't remove the feasible solutions that exist, so that there will still be some, some solution left. And when comparing these two, uh, we have uh, used some public instances, uh, 30 instances uh, with the ranges that you see here. And we made the, the computations on two different clusters, unfortunately. So for the first decomposition approach, we, we used the fat nodes and we needed to have fat nodes with a lot of memory. Uh, but for the other one, we used thin nodes uh, only and that was sufficient. So when you look at the comparison with respect to time, you should keep in mind that, that uh, the memory usage is, is different. The results look like this. So for the first decomposition approach, if we look at this instance category D, we have time here on the x-axis and the number of instances sold within a certain time. Um, 
we see that we couldn't solve that many of these instances. They were rather challenging in this category. But when we included the ALNS, we get the red curve here. You can see that we could solve almost all of them, uh, given enough time. And if we look at the composition approach too, we can see that we can quickly solve quite a lot of the problems. But then we here we hit the issues with the, with the timeouts and, and stuff with these instances. If we use these timeout cuts, that um, makes it possible to, to solve some more instances. So it, it improves a bit. So to, to summarize, uh, I've presented two different decomposition approaches for this problem. And they different decisions made by the master problem and the sub problem, and what type of feedback information that we use. What's common for the subproblem is the sequencing and that it has a lot of tasks to sequence. And if we compare here what, what kind of solver it was possible to use, so uh, this order based MIP formulation solved by Gurobi, it was possible to use if we restrict the tasks to their sub intervals in the subproblem, and it's possible to include an objective function. Uh, in, in the other case, uh, we, we, had, we didn't restrict the tasks to the subintervals, but we solved the feasibility problem only. And then the, the constraint programming solver was very useful. So we've tried to switch what uh, solver we used in the different cases, and it didn't seem to work well. So it's rather specific types of, of problems that they are, they are good for. And of course, we it would be very nice if we could solve this sub problem but we ha haven't been able to do that this far and this one is not very interesting because it's dominated by the others so i think i will skip this one with respect to time uh, just briefly mention weak points and some remedies uh, in the first approach uh, we had to include a heuristic component to solve the really large problems uh, we also needed to be careful with the modeling and rescaling of the problem uh, because of numerics. And in the other one, it was important to strengthen the cuts and handle the timeout issues. But this is also an ongoing work, so perhaps we will come up with some more improvements. Finally, some acknowledgements. Uh, this is part of a project funded by the Ries Center of Industrial Information Technology. Uh, and my student is supported by the Research School in Interdisciplinary Mathematics. We have used computational resources at the National Supercomputer Center. And I also want to give a special thanks to, to Justin Pearson and Pierre Flanner at Uppsala University. Uh, some years ago, we co-supervised some master thesis and they kindly introduced me to constraint programming. And I don't think we would have done this work without uh, that collaboration. So. So special thanks to them. And also, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Elena, for like quite an interesting talk.